On Larry King Now, Martina McBride, the country music superstar, gets real. I think that it's just, you know, it's your personal morals and values, and, and like I said, I, t I, I believe in acceptance. Reveals a side you may not have seen. I can be a badass when I need to be. <laughs> Favorite curse word? Actually, it's the S word. Really? More than the F word? Well, I, like, I love the F word, too. Plus. Right now, at Country Radio, there are a lot of male artists getting played, and very few female artists getting played mm. right now. But I feel like it's going to come back around. Next, my rare interview with the CEO of the Industrial Food Image Bureau, Buck Marshall. All next on Larry King Now. Welcome to Larry King Now. Our guest is the great star, Martina McBride, the country music singer, songwriter. She's won every major musical award, was inducted into the Grand Old Opry, and her new album, Everlasting, will be out April 8th. I have it right here in my hands. <laughs> why do I have to wait till April? You can listen to it any time. Okay. <laughs> why does it come out? Why April? Why not tomorrow? I know. It always seems like it's it, it needs to be sooner, you know, but April will be here before you know it. Did you inherit those eyes? <laughs> Did your mother have them, your father? Yeah, my mom. I think they came from my, mo my they're mom. They're blue, but they're more than blue, right? How would you describe them? Um, ex I don't know. Very they're blue? Bright blue? They're <laughs> very, very, yeah, they're bright blue. Yeah, okay. Thank you. You were once referred to, uh, Cheryl Crow called you a badass. <laughs> Are you a badass? I think we did a show together, and, and she was maybe talking about on stage. But yeah, I, I, would, I'm a, I can be a badass when I need to be. <laughs> I'll never forget, Martina, after 9-11, you sang on our show on CNN, mm -hmm. just made a week or two later. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was a terror. Where were you that day? I was in Nashville and um, had just kind of was getting up and having my coffee, and my husband called me, and then he came home, and we just sat and watched, you know, everything unfold. It was a terrible day. Unbelievable. You're one of only three women to win the CMA Female Vocalist of the Year four times. Joined the Grand Ole Opry in 95. Are you, are you ever surprise yourself at your success? Oh, absolutely, all the time. Yeah, I, I grew up on a farm in Kansas and a very, very small town of about 200 people. And um, I had 10 people in my graduating class. I mean, it was just really Ten. small. <laughs> so, but I've always known that this is what I wanted to do. I've sang, you know, my whole life and wanted to, to make records and perform and sing for people. And so... But it's it's like when I look back at what I've what all the things that I've experienced and done. What was your break? My break came. I moved to Nashville and um, and you know I was waiting tables and singing demos. And my husband was production manager for Garth Brooks at the time. And so I went out and sold T-shirts for Garth, uh, sold merchandising <laughs> while I was trying to get a record deal and uh, got to know him that way. And then when I got my record deal, he gave me. A spot on his tour opening as the opening act for 77 shows. Not a bad break. Not a bad break. Yeah, it was great. So he liked you right away. Yeah, well, actually, he took a huge chance on me, really, because he'd never seen me sing or perform on stage. And I think when we went, the first couple of shows we did, my single wasn't even out yet. So he just took a leap of faith. And, um, you know, I'm really, it was a great break for me. He's that kind of guy. He is, yeah. Tell me about the album. Well, this Everlasting. album, yeah. That's, is that one of the songs? Nope, it's not one of the songs. I just chose that title because, you know, these songs are so iconic and timeless and... and um, these are all well-known songs? Yeah. Well, I, some of them might be new to some people, but it's basically, uh, you know, we covered Aretha Franklin, Otis Redding, Ben Morrison, Elvis, Harold Melvin and the Blue Notes, you know. I why, just, why other material? I just felt like... You know, I love to sing. I mean, I'm a country music artist, but at the end of the day, I'm a vocalist. I love to sing everything and um, all kinds of music. And it's fun, you know, sometimes to, to stretch a little bit and do something a little different. And I just so, sort of listened to my creative, that little voice that says, I think this would be a good idea. And so I just had a lot of fun with it. Don was produced it for me, and, and it was just Was your of, husband the sound engineer? He was, yeah. <laughs> He, he did. He tracked the, all the band and and uh, mixed most of the songs on the record. Did it in Nashville. Mm -hmm. What was your first hit? My first hit was a song called. Um, well, I had my first single was a song called "The Time Has Come." I don't think we could really call it a hit, <laughs> but probably "My Baby Loves Me" was a. And then "Independence Day," of course, was on that same album. And that went through the roof, right? 
Well, that, you know, it's interesting. That song only went to about, I think, number 11 on the chart. But it's but. still my career song and, you know, the song I'm most known for, I think. When you write your own songs? I have written some songs, yeah. Mm -hmm. Rick Hall was here last week, the great music producer, yeah. and he said he was always good at picking a hit. Uh -huh. he, he could just, he knew. Uh -huh. You know? Sometimes I do. Yeah, sometimes I'll hear a song and think, uh, well, that should be a hit. You know, everything that you put out isn't always, there are a lot of factors involved in, in what makes a hit, you know, but um, I, I think I've got, I've cho chosen some, a few, yeah. What do you look for? Different things make a hit. You know, there, sometimes it's a melody, it's a catchy melody, it's a hook. And sometimes it's more about the lyric and the emotion in the song. And how it's produced, right? Mm -hmm. yeah, Which your husband is a... Hey, you, you're not afraid of tough subjects, though, right? You'll deal with things that involve the culture. Yeah, we did, uh, you know, some of my songs have dealt with... Uh, well, Independence Day was about domestic abuse, and Concrete Angel was about child abuse, and we had a song a couple years ago about surviving cancer, and, you know, I don't really set out, everybody asks me, do you set out to find those kind of songs, and I, I don't ever, I mean, they really just find me, but when I hear a song like that, that I feel like is going to be a song that people can make their own and makes, feel like somebody knows what they're going through, it just, I don't know, I just have an instinct to want to... Sing that. You've sung all over the world. Is country music worldwide now? Um, I think in some places. I don't know if I would say it's worldwide, but uh, it does very well in the UK and Australia. Those are two markets that country music is big. You like traveling? I love traveling, yeah. You do? I do. You worked all these You worked England? I have. I'm actually going back in March. We're doing a big festival over there in London on March 15th. Coming up, we'll talk with Martina about where she stands on issues. We'll find out just more about the life of this incredible talent, Martina McBride, we saw her on the Grammys. Don't go away. We're back with the incredible Martina McBride. Her new CD will be out. Is it still called CDs? They are, okay. yes. <laughs> you never know. It changes every day. Everlasting 2014. It'll be out in April. Uh, did you, you were very, you speak out a lot about the gay issue. In Out Magazine, you spoke publicly about tolerance. You said, I have three daughters, and that's what I teach them. I think we should all be tolerant of each other, embrace each other's strengths and differences and uniqueness. Incredible at the Grammys, they married gay couples. Mm -hmm. Do you get a lot of backlash from the conservatives in the country community, which are many? No, I don't, actually. Um, I think that it's just, you know, it's your personal... Uh, morals and values, and, and like I said, I, t I, I believe in acceptance. But the country community is, has been late to it, hasn't it? Wouldn't you say that fairly? Um, I don't know that you can generalize like that. You know, I think, yes, there are people that are, are very, are not tolerant and accepting, and then there are people that are. So um, I have fans that are probably both, you know, I've both... But you've never I've, had repercussions. I haven't. I mean, I... I I think that there are people in every kind of music and every walk of life that are probably have, you know, that are conservative and don't agree with it and people that, that do agree with it. So I don't know about like singling out country music. I think that we have, a, obviously we have a lot of conservative fans in country music, but I try and I don't think of my fans as one way, you know, I think I have a lot of very diverse group of fans, so. What did you think of the idea on the Grammys of the marriage? I thought it was really great. It was, was really moving too. and emotional. I was in the audience. And uh, just to see the happiness and the joy, you know, and, and being on their faces and being part of that moment. Great was, idea. Yeah. By the way, the Grammys have changed. Now they only gave out 10 awards in three and a half hours of a mm -hmm. telecast. They give the other awards, I guess, during the... Because they give a lot of awards. Mm -hmm. Do you like it better now? You know, I... It's a musical show. It, they, they try to get as many performances on as possible, you know, and I feel like, I, I think there has to be a balance. You know, I think that people tune in to see performances, but they also want to see who, won, who wins the award and hear the acceptance speeches and all of that, too, so. Yeah, I, I was, I like award. I like to see who presented. Yeah. You were a presenter. I was. There. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You were one of them, the only 10 presenters, the whole. That's true. I never thought of it that way. <laughs> <laughs> Stars, the, the country music genre is changing, right? Stars crossing over, Taylor Swift, right? Mm -hmm. Do you do crossovers? I have had a few songs that have crossed over, yeah, to AC. 
Valentine, it's, and um, this one's for the girls, and In My Daughter's Eyes were three crossovers. Country music is now the most, it's the most popular form of radio mm -hmm. in America, right? I think As so, yeah. As a format, country music. So you, you must be played everywhere. Sometimes I am. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you get a lot of airplay, right? Yeah, I do. Has the country <laughs> scene changed a lot since you started? Yeah, but you know, it's interesting because I feel like throughout history, there have always been crossover artists in country music. You know, we've, people like Johnny Cash was, had hits on the pop chart. and Eddie and Arnold. Eddie Arnold and Glenn Campbell and Dolly Parton. And I mean, there's always, there have always been crossover artists in country music. So I don't feel like in that way it's really changed that much. The country musician and the fan. That's incredible. Of all the styles of music, all, they are the closest, right? How I you, believe so, yes. How do you explain that? I've been to Fanfare. Yeah. I interviewed you when you were at Fan. The, 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 they, it's very uh, not unusual to see country stars closely attached with their fans. Yeah, I, well, I... I just feel like we're, we're, we're very accessible, you know? I think that that fan relate the relationship with our fans is so um, important. And I mean, I feel like they're friends, you know? And especially with social media, since social media has become such a huge way of, of connecting um, with Twitter and Facebook and all of that. I kind of, when I first was asked to do that, I was a little put off or just confused by it. Because, it, you know, it's, it's so different to say, connect in that way, to show people an, a glimpse of inside your life and what, you know, what you had for lunch or what you think <laughs> you about this removed. or that. Right, and, but I feel like since I've embraced it and, um, I really enjoy it now because I do feel like it's a connection, you know, with my fans. I feel like it's a way to, to connect and to show them a little bit different side than they might just see in a 10-minute interview or whatever. And women have always been kind of equal in the country field, haven't they? I mean, we've always had, or, or am I new to that? No, I mean, I feel like, yeah, we've had obviously some like, huge iconic women. Um, it was always open to, has it changed or it's still wide open? I think it's cyclical, honestly. I think we have, like right now at Country Radio, there, there's a huge, um, there are a lot of male artists getting played and very few female artists getting played mm. right now. But, but you think it's cyclical? I do. Yeah, because a few years ago, you know, there, was, there were a lot of women getting played. We had Faith Hill and Winona and Reba and um, Leanne Womack. And I mean, just a bunch of people that were, that it was really a, a great time for women at Country Radio. And, and then now, not quite so much, but I feel like it's going to come back around. Next, when we come back, how Martina has managed to stay out of the tabloids. We never <laughs> see anything bad about her. The album Everlasting is coming in April. Don't click away. You're watching Larry King now. Our guest is the fabulous Martina McBride. How have you stayed, like so many other celebrities haven't, how have you stayed out of the Inquirer and the Globe? <laughs> And I'm MT boring. and whatever that is, at TMZ and MCY and CYQ and <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. You know, I I um I don't know. I just don't do anything that I guess is interesting to them. <laughs> <laughs> uh, paparazzi don't follow you down the street. No, that's one great thing about Nashville. You know, yeah, I don't why wanna, is that different? I don't know, but I hope it never changes because it is different. We don't have that issue there. Like like in LA. Or when you travel, do you get them? Sometimes, yeah, at the airport, sometimes. Have you ever had a bad story in the Inquirer? No. No. <laughs> <laughs> Let's make one up. In other words, up. what Let's you're make saying. One up right here. I don't want to break this out, Martina. It's just saying you're boring. I think I am. You just yeah. don't attract anyone. <laughs> I think Your so. Your husband and you are faithful to each other. Yeah. It's no you're normal. Yeah. <laughs> how you how did you get booked? <laughs> How did I get on this show? How are you on this show? You have three. You met your husband before you were famous, right? I did. Uh -huh. How did that happen? How did you meet? We we met in Wichita, Kansas. He, he's a Kansan. He's from Kansas as well. And I was putting a band together, trying to get this band together to go out and play gigs. And uh, he had a rehearsal. He had a sound company, a concert sound company that did sound for local shows. So he was always into sound. Yeah, always into sound, and had uh, a rehearsal space that he had just built. So I rented that from him, and we just got to be really good friends and. We'll be married 26 years in May. It started as a friendship? Yes. How does that change? Because usually romance starts with, you know, bang, it's romance. Yeah, I don't know. I think it was bang romance for him. <laughs> <laughs> for me, I took a little bit of time to get to know him and stuff. And, and uh, But I knew it. Like, it, it happened one day we were talking, and I just knew it. Like, it hit me. I, 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 he was talking about going out on tour, and I thought to myself, I don't. I I want to be with this person. I would marry this guy if he asked me to marry him. So, and I'd never felt that way before. 
And you sent a signal, I presume. Well, it's interesting that you say that because how he proposed to me, we were, um, we were talking outside late at night and he said, well, it's, it's time to go. And I said, isn't there something you want to ask me? Because he'd hinted at it before. And we, we, we really only dated for about a month and a half before we got engaged. So he kept saying about, you know, asking me to marry him. And I was like, I, don't, I, don't, I barely know you. Let's just give this some time, right? But in that moment, for some reason, I don't know what came over me, but I knew, I just knew. And, he, and I said, isn't there something you want to ask me? And he said, yeah. And then he asked me to marry him. And then we waited a year. To, uh, we set the date a year ahead. Why? Well, I think we instinctively knew that it was pretty quick. Like, we, we met in J January and we got engaged in May, so. So smart. Yeah, we needed Proved out all right. It did, yeah. Three daughters, did you want a boy? No, nope, neither one of us. We, we, I was praying for girls. Really? Uh-huh. Do you want them to sing? Do they sing? Um, not really. And my middle daughter wants to be an actress, so she's, uh, she's, that's her dream. And my oldest daughter, is, she's going to college for music business, so I think she'll be involved in the business in some way. And then I have an eight-year-old who, who knows, right? Your brothers are in a band, right? My brother is in my band, You're yes, my younger brother. Now, they, I know I went through this I, with having young boys, but I had to raise one girl. Uh -huh. Girls are different. Uh -huh. You wouldn't know because she didn't raise right. a boy. Right. Did you go through some tumultuous times? Not anything, uh, you know, not anything that would get in the tabloids. <laughs> no, you know, so you never Obviously. had a child, had a drug problem, never had any? No, I've been very, very fortunate. I'm just, they're just really good girls, and you know, I mean, fingers crossed, it'll stay that way. Is it easy bringing up kids in Nashville? Yeah, Nashville's a great place to raise kids. It's, uh, the people are very friendly. It's, it's kind of, um, have you spent much time in Nashville? My wife is recorded there. Okay. In fact, so, your, your husband was sound engineer once when she recorded really? in Nashville. Really? Yeah. Wow, small world, but, right? But, uh, yeah, I like Nashville. It's like a small, it's like a city, but it's, it ha really has kind of a small town mentality. And I think people watch out for each other, and, you know, it's a community, so. In fact, she sang at the Grand Ole Opry, and I introduced her. Really? Yeah, to have me come out. It was a lot That's of awesome. fun. Is religion part of your life? Mm hmm Are you very religious? No. I wouldn't, I mean, I, I need to be, I probably need to be more, you know. I think I need to feel the need that sometimes I need to make that more of a priority. But my faith is very important, yeah. Who's the stricter parent? Me. Definitely. Three girls. Are you kidding? They have John wrapped around their oh, yeah. finger. Fathers and daughters, right? Yeah. They're, they're How old are the girls? Delaney is 19. Uh, Emma is 15. She'll be 16 in March. She's going to be getting her driver's license. <laughs> and Ava is 8. So you space them out pretty yeah. good. Yeah. Do they have a tour with you? They go on tour with me sometimes, yeah. You know, they, toured, they were with me all the time on the tour bus and on planes and everywhere we went until they started school. And then when Delaney started kindergarten, we, we had to slow down our touring schedule, and then she would still come with us on the weekends, but then, because we just toured on the weekends. But now that they're in, like, high school and college, it's just really hard to get, well, first of all, it's hard to get them on a bus for the weekend. It's not their idea of no. how they want to spend their weekend on a bus with mom and dad. But um, it's just hard for them to miss school. How often do you tour? We tour, we kind of tour like three three days a week usually, like Friday, Saturday, Sunday, sometimes a Thursday. So it's not a heavy Different tour. cities or one city for Different the week? Different cities. Yeah, all over the place. The only place I haven't performed is uh, Hawaii or Alaska. Uh, the, those are the only states Every I state? Haven't. Every state, other than that. South Dakota? Mm-hmm. Montana? Yes. <laughs> Maine? Yeah. Bangor. <laughs> Uh -huh. And uh, you got to do air a lot when, you, when you've made it. You don't have to do buses, do you? No, I, well, see, I'm kind of a nervous flyer, so I really like to, t to go take the tour bus. It's so comfortable in there. Like, you know, you have everything you need, and you can relax, and you go to sleep, and you wake up, and you're in the next town. What is it like when a nervous flyer has to fly? I used to be really, really bad. Like, I, it was kind of uh, paralyzing for me, really. Every, like, before I would fly, the Three or four days before I would fly, I would imagine like every conversation sort of had an air of finality about it. You know, it would be like <laughs> I would imagine the news. I mean, I just the new. It was uh, terrible, and I've gotten better. I've realized that you know, a couple glasses of red wine helps a lot. No, you're not kidding. Yeah. <laughs> Me too. All right, Martina will answer your question. We'll play a game of You Only Knew next, and the album comes out in April, and it's called Everlasting. Don't go away. 
We're back with Martina McBride. We have some uh, social media questions. You brought up social media. Mm -hmm. Tracy May of Facebook, if you had to choose which song on the new album speaks the most to you? Oh, my goodness. Let me take a look. <laughs> um, look it up. Let's see. Well, one song, well, To Know Him Is To Love Him. Isn't that sweet? That's, that's, I sing that about my husband. I'll tell you, there's this, um, I, I love Wild Night because it's so much fun. It's like. Who are you covering there? Who Van Morrison. And the song, I've heard the song all my life, but when I, you know, sometimes you'll hear a song and you think you know a song, and then when you go to sing it and you have to really emote the lyrics and figure out what the lyrics are exactly, because he's a little hard to understand when he sings. Um, <laughs> it's just a song about having fun. It's a song about getting ready and going out for the night. And the way it's written is so visual. Like, I can just see the whole video or the whole thing in my head. I love that. You were at the Grammys. Did you understand any of the rap lyrics? <laughs> no. No. <laughs> I watched the show and I'm trying to figure, what the hell are they talking about? <laughs> They could be say, talking about crazy things, right? Yeah. You know, Hitler lives. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> Patricia Moore Blake wants to know what was the first song you ever performed on stage? The first song I ever performed on stage was Oh Holy Night. I was in kindergarten, about five years old, six years old, and I we they made a with scaffolding and stuff, uh, sort of a human Christmas tree, and I was at the very top, and I sang a solo on Oh Holy Night. And you knew then. I loved it. Yeah. Uh, John 500 tweets, what do you have in store for your music career this year? The album's coming in April, what else? Yeah, we're going to tour. We started tour at the end of April, 1st of May. Uh, we're still booking dates, but... Um, like, where are you definitely going? Well, I don't know yet. Because we're, we're actually, we're doing Greeley, Colorado on July 4th. I know that much. That's I know where I'm going to be on the 4th, 4th of July. That's a big July 4th yeah. day there, right? The fair. Yeah, exactly. You going to come? Not Greeley, I don't know. Do you sing outdoors a lot? Yeah. Have you done that, that big uh, night of fire in Utah? No. Oh, that's a wild July 4th. Well, yeah. next year. Next year, they'll get you. <laughs> I'll get you booked. Okay. Jalen Watts of Facebook. When will she do a duet with Carrie Underwood? Oh, I, I, there are no plans to do a duet with Carrie Underwood, but that would be fantastic. Do you like duetting? I do. Male and female? Yeah, I have two duets on this album, on the new album. We did a duet with Gavin DeGraw on an old Sam Cooke song called Bring It On Home To Me. And we did a duet with, I did a duet with Kelly Clarkson. Oh, really? Yeah. And Etta James, Sugar Pie Santos song called In The Basement. It's really fun. It, when you sing duets, do, do one have to harmonize with the other? Sometimes, yeah. I mean, I think, you know, the best duets are where you, you can kind of um, trade lines or trade verses and then come together on the chorus. And Country's been doing that forever, right? Yeah. I mean, Pop Sinatra really did the first really major pop where he duetted with other people. I didn't know that. On duets. But other than that, you know, Tony Bennett didn't sing with Steve Lawrence. Right, right. But country music has always done that, right? Yeah, there's been some big duets. I mean, I don't think there are as many as, as we should have. You know, I think the fans really enjoy when you... I've, I've been able to do some amazing duets. I've been able to duet with Bob Seger, uh, Jimmy Buffett. How about Garth Brooks? I haven't sang with Garth Brooks. I think I know why. I asked him. He will only sing with his wife. Oh, well, that's sweet. He, you, you, you've never seen him sing a duet, right? Yep, that's right. Okay, we'd like to play a game called If You Only Knew. You ready, Martina? Oh, yes. First boy you ever kissed. First boy I ever kissed was a, a George, a boyfriend George. George. <laughs> How old were you, Martina? Probably, I was probably junior in high school, senior in high that school. That took maybe. that long? Yeah. See, I'm not in the tabloids. I'm, I'm well, telling what, you, I'm boring. Was I don't it know, in school, Martina? Where'd you kiss George? Uh, oh, God, it's a long time ago. Um, well, it's Kansas, what, a hayride. <laughs> it, might be in a, it might have been in a van, actually. In a van? Mm -hmm. you, you ever know what happened to George? Yeah, I think he lives in Nebraska. <laughs> his, I think he's married and has maybe one or two kids. I'm not but sure. he tells everyone. <laughs> uh, biggest regret? You know, I don't have a lot of regrets. Dream duet. Oh, that's a hard one. Well, Garth would be good. <laughs> I'd have to marry him first, and I don't think that's going to happen. <laughs> Music style people would be surprised that you listen to. Um, I listen to, well, I think some people are probably surprised by this record. You know, I love soul music. I love Ray Charles and Aretha Franklin and Otis Redding. and So that's where this, the idea for this album came. It was my love for that music. If you weren't a singer, what would you be? I think I'd be a party planner. I love theater. <laughs> I love yeah. it. Yeah. Favorite food. If I had to pick one kind last of food, meal. yeah, oh, last meal, it'd probably be something Italian. 
I think if you had to eat one kind of food for the rest of your life, it would probably be Italian, for me. Uh, there is Southern food. We know about Southern food. Yeah. Is there Kansas food? Yeah, lots of casseroles. <laughs> casseroles. Yeah. Person you most look up to? Probably my husband, honestly. He's just a very um, compassionate, generous, he's very generous of spirit. And I, close I in age? That. He's eight and a half years older than me. Best advice you ever got? Stay true to yourself. Favorite curse word? Oh, I can't say it on here. You know, it's, actually it's the S word. Really, more than the F word? Well, I, like, I love the F word too. Yeah. I guess the F word is a great word. It is a great word, right? Absolutely. Is there great. anything more, uh, my daughter was saying to me the other day, she's like, there, ha there needs to be a word that's more intense than that. No. Is there a word that's more the intense than that? The best word is because, as Lenny Bruce used to say, you can use it in anger, uh huh. Yeah. It's <laughs> colloquial for intercourse. So he says, when he gets mad at someone, he says, un. Oh. <laughs> That's hilarious. You're a doll. Thank you. Thanks again to my guest, Martina McBride. And I recently sat down with the CEO of the Industrial Food Image Bureau, Buck Marshall, for a candid discussion about GMO labeling. Hey, check it out. Our show today focuses on the public's increasing concern with modern industrial agriculture practices. We reached out to all the major agriculture and chemical companies, and coincidentally, they all referred us to the Industrial Food Image Bureau. The head of IFIB is Buck Marshall. He joins me today. Welcome, Buck. Thank you. Great to be here, Larry. Now, you have been labeled, I want to get this right, a spin doctor for industrial agriculture, a master manipulator, and an evil <laughs> creep genius who... I prefer image consultant. See, that's the problem with labels. Often they just point out things that people don't really need to know. Vote no on GMO labeling. GMO labeling. Okay, let's talk about your position on that. I thought I covered that. Well, in 2013, get this, nearly half of the states in America introduced bills requiring labeling on or prohibiting genetically engineered foods. Mm. You and your clients fought those bills. What's the harm in pointing out when food's been genetically modified? Because it could be dangerous, Larry. Look what labels did for cigarettes. People stopped smoking. What would happen if people stopped eating? You know, you represent a lot of companies who manufactured processed foods, known to be high in trans fats, sugar. Well, not all processed foods are bad for you. By definition, milk is a processed food because it's homogenized. Therefore, if you're against processed foods, you're obviously homogenophobic. I don't think that's what... Get with the times, Larry. Uh, <laughs> let's talk about the rampant use of subtherapeutic antibiotics and synthetic growth hormones in... Professional athletes? <laughs> Larry, do we try to keep our animals healthy? Guilty as charged. Do we add hormones so that we can get more out of them to be more efficient? Guilty. Your critics say that you wouldn't need to use antibiotics if you fixed the unsanitary and inhumane conditions found at many industrial animal operations. And that's why we passed the Animal Enterprise Terrorism Act, to protect us from those critics. How so? Well, it ensures that people can't trespass on animal enterprise operations to see what's going on back there. If they do, we can label them terrorists. But I thought labeling was a bad thing. Whose side are you on, Larry? The terrorists? Uh, Bob Martin, the director at Johns Hopkins uh, Center for Livable Future, recently said, quote, I want to get this right, the animal agriculture industry has more money than the tobacco industry and the personality of the National Rifle Association. What do you say to that? Thanks for the compliment. Can we talk about the rampant use of petroleum? No. Buck, you have cleared up nothing and made everything more confusing and more complex. Frankly, I'm a little ticked. Well, thank you. I hope that everyone's misconceptions are now a little bit more accurate. Thanks to my guest, Buck Marshall. And remember, you can find me on Twitter at Kingsdames.